Open your Bibles. Open your Bibles. Let's have a Bible study. Turn him to Revelation chapter 14. 14, chapter 14. How about, how about if we do the whole chapter? You all right with it? Yeah. Okay, all right, because we're doing it whether you are or not. Uh, it's 20 verses, verse 1 to verse 20. Title of the message this morning, Remember Jesus Wins. Yeah. Amen? Amen, 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 amen. So there's a burglar, walks into a house he knows is vacant right? And he's, he's walking across the room, and there's a parrot in the corner, and the parrot says, what? Jesus is watching. <laughs> Burglar says, shut up, parrot. Parrot says again, what? Jesus is watching. Burglar says again, shut up, parrot. And then he turns around, and he sees a 150-pound Rottweiler with its teeth showing, and the parrot says, what? Sick him, Jesus. In the end, Jesus wins. Huh? In the end, Jesus wins. All right, here's what we need to know about that. Somebody marked that down because I never start a message with a joke. It's so cliche. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that one I couldn't help. All right, listen. Here's the thing you got to know about today. Chapter 14. Revelation is not chronological. I've said that, right? Revelation, we wish it, we wish it read like a good movie plot. And, and it does, but it's not chronological. So there's like a general series of events, but it's not specifically written chronologically. So what helps us when we, we try to figure out why is this here and not there and has this happened, has this not happened, it's really important that we remember the purpose of the book. And honestly, any book you study, any book you read, you have to know the purpose of the book. You have to take a little bit of time and say, why was this book written? Well, Revelation is the revealing, the revelation singular, right? There is no book of revelations, plural. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the singular revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the purpose of the book of, the, of Revelation is to reveal the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So if we really get a hold of that, it helps us um, not worry so much about whether the chapters are perfectly chronological. So uh, today, chapter 14 does not fit in the chronological timeline perfectly, but it does make the most important point really clear. Brenda loved when I did MIPs every message. Um, so we used to do MIPs every message. It stands for most important point, and I still do them. I just don't tell you that I'm doing them. Today's most important point, guess what it is? Jesus wins. That's it. That's it. Remember, Jesus wins. It's the only thing I'm asking you to get a hold of today. Jesus wins in the end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you show us just how true that is, Lord? God, we worry. We um, we see what's going on in the world, Lord, especially now as is finally, Lord, we hear these rumblings of world war. But Lord, you told us, you told us 2,000 years ago more that evil would increase in the world. And so, Lord, show us today that you win. And show us today that we win in you and with you for your glory and for our good, we pray. In your name, Jesus, amen, amen. So in Revelation chapter 14, we're gonna see seven visions. In 20 verses, we're gonna see seven visions. All seven visions have one thing in common. 
they all show the absolute guaranteed victory of Jesus Christ over Satan and over the world. And and it's really good of God to do this in chapter 14 because chapter 13 was rough. I was talking to my mom the other night and she watches every Sunday and she says, I really want you to be done with Revelation, honey. Um, It scares me, you know, it gives me nightmares. Um, And so uh, I thought a lot about my mom when I was writing this message. Uh, But listen, 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 Jesus wins. He wins over Satan, he wins over the world system, he wins over the tribulation. We've seen a lot of death and destruction in chapter 13, a lot at the hands of the satanic trinity. And so God stops the um, kind of the chronology in chapter 14 and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, you know, don't forget, Jesus wins. Jesus wins, we need to remember that today. As I prayed, uh, the Bible is clear that evil will escalate in the world. All right, that's, that's what the Bible says. Uh, this world is going to hell, and we are watching it. Now more than ever, we are watching it. So evil is gonna escalate on the earth. Satan will, in the tribulation, will seem to be, for a time, he'll seem to be winning. He'll seem to be kind of getting the upper hand during the tribulation. What we need to hear loud and clear today is Jesus wins. Can you, I'm gonna say this like a hundred times, so you might as well get saying it with me. Say it with me, Jesus wins. Jesus wins, man. We need to hear it, we need to remember it, and we need to live according to it, and we need to not be afraid of what we see, because though we wish it weren't true, the Bible is clear that the world will get more evil before Jesus wins. So today, chapter 14, direct contrast to chapters 12 and 13, and, and that's, this, is the, this is why. It's this radical contrast to remind us that God is still in control. God is still in control. Jesus Christ is going to win. And we are more than conquerors, super victorious in Christ. All those things is what shows so clear in chapter 14. Jesus wins, and if we are with him, we win. Jesus wins, and if we are against him, we lose. That's the gospel message, and it's our most important point today. So we start in chapter 14, verse one. What's the chapter about again? Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. So I tell Husto all the time, and other, other kids, you know, other young guys that, that I help learn to teach, if, if the people listening to you can remember the main point of your message by the end of the night Sunday, you know, the same day you taught, then you did good. So tonight, remember, Jesus wins. Revelation 14, verse one, the first victory. It's the victory of the 144,000 who have been brought through the tribulation sealed by God. Revelation 14, one. Then I saw the lamb, that's Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's a reference to the seal of God on these 144,000. And remember, they're Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. They are the sealed witnesses for God. But what we're focused on today is this is an awesome picture of victory. Why? Because Jesus is standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000 who have come through the tribulation. Mount Zion on earth is Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter two says that the Lord will reign on earth from Mount Zion in the millennium. We know that Jesus will return, set his foot on the Mount of Olives, it will split in half, and he will rule during the millennium from 
Jerusalem, that's also called Mount Zion. But Mount Zion is also used um, like spiritually to represent the place where God dwells with his people. And so the, our point today in verse one is these 144,000, everyone, notice it doesn't say 143,999, right? Everyone that God sealed is with him in this vision of victory standing on Mount Zion. It's the ultimate victory for those who are sealed by God. How many of you know that if you're saved today that you are sealed by God? Do you know? Okay, Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. Write that in your margin next to 14.1 of Revelation. Write Ephesians one, verse 13. What it says is when we put our faith in Jesus as our own Savior, our personal Savior, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit as the guarantor, it's as a guarantee of our eternal victory and our eternal inheritance. It's just like the 144,000 are sealed during the tribulation. We are sealed by God, Ephesians 1.13 says, we are sealed by God for victory. Here's what Jesus says. You can write John 10, 28 down too in your margin there. John 10, 28 says, Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. No one can snatch them away from me. We are sealed by God. It's true for the 144,000, and if you put your faith in Christ today as your own Savior and Lord, then it's just as true for you as it is for these 144,000. Amen? Okay. Ready for the second guarantee, the second victory vision? It's in verses two and three of Revelation 14. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of mighty ocean waves or the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. You might wanna underline that, the 24 elders. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So second vision in heaven, showing again absolute assurance of victory for those who have been sealed by God. Heaven is roaring. <laughs> the praise of his glory. The heaven is singing like the roar of a mighty ocean like the rolling of loud thunder. They're singing a new song before the throne of God, specifically for the 144,000. But why did I have you underline those words, the 24 elders? I, it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's not rhetorical, but you don't have to answer. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brad knows. It's us. It's us. In Revelation chapter four, we met the 24 elders. Uh, when John was raptured, representing the church, the 24 elders lay their crowns, they throw their crowns before the throne. That's us, that's what the Bible says we will do. So we are here, this is super cool. We, the church is here when the, when the 144,000 show up as this massive you know, praise team. This is, this is rock and roll concert level. Roar of a mighty ocean and rolling a loud thunder. And the 24 elders, that's us, are there celebrating this great victory for the 144,000 and celebrating the victory that we are there because we are sealed just as they are. Now, you ready for some balance news? Okay, you are, right? Okay. Raul did this Wednesday night. He did this balance, and it's really important. So we see these sealed by God. They had a role in their victory, just like you and I have a role in our victory. Did, did you hear me? They're sealed by God. Their, their victory is guaranteed. 
but it doesn't mean they don't have a role. They do. They have a role. And if you've received Christ, then you are sealed by God, but it doesn't mean you don't have a role. You have a role in response to God sealing you as his own. Here is the, resp- uh, the role of the 144,000. It's in Revelation 14, verse 4. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins. This is referring to spiritual purity. And as we continue through Revelation from this point on, more and more, um, you know, we get this, this image of physical purity or adultery, but it's actually a reference to spiritual purity. They've kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb, meaning following the Lamb only wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. They have told no lies, they are without blame. Now, uh, that last phrase in verse five just means that they've been transparent and honest in the tribulation. Uh, they've, They've done what they've been called to do, so don't think like, oh man, I lied to my mom when I was seven, so I'm not gonna get in. Uh, <laughs> your mom might have told you that, like my wife told my kids, but, <laughs> but that's not true. This is about transparency for the 144,000. So they've been sealed by God, but they've also been purely devoted to God. Does that make sense? They've been sealed by God, their victory is assured by God, but they've also been devoted to Jesus. They've not committed spiritual adultery with the false religion of the world and the tribulation. They've been purchased by God, redeemed. Purchased by God as a special offering to God and the Lamb. So sealed by God, devoted to God, in total victory with God. I love this. I love this. I should have made a slide for you because... Um, that's the way you do it. Uh, That's the way you do it. Um, That's the way you do it. You are sealed by God, you are devoted to God, and you stand in victory with God, right? You're sealed by God, you're devoted to God, and you stand in victory with God. Woo, man, that's good, isn't it? All right, all right, number three, more victory. This time it covers the whole earth, verse six. Revelation 14, verse six and seven. Verse six says, and I saw another angel, meaning after the first one, I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news, that's the gospel, to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to proclaim the good news to the people who belong to this world. That phrase, belong to this world, uh, saved for, (laughs) it's reserved for unsaved people. People who are citizens of this world as opposed to citizens of heaven. They belong to this world, the eternal good news is proclaimed to them to every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. Here's the good news message, verse seven, fear God the angel shouted. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. It's actually a reference to the millennium first, and then great white throne judgment ultimately, but initially reference to the millennium when Jesus will sit as judge in Jerusalem over the earth. The time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. So listen, at this point, the eternal good news has covered the earth. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus has covered the earth. The good news of the grace of God and the mercy of God. Listen, it is the grace of God and the mercy of God that is the good news. That's the good news, is that God shows you and I, grace and mercy. And this good news will reach every tribe, every language, every people, and the world will hear, I think mostly one last time. Like, I started thinking about this and thought, well, I wonder if 
if there'll be some people on the earth at this point who have never heard the gospel. And maybe, maybe, they may be, but they'll hear right now, one last time, those who belong to the world, referencing those who have, have probably previously rejected Christ, they'll hear the gospel that brings salvation and eternal life. And then the message, because it is so close, the message is very direct. Fear God and give him glory. Um, the angel is, is not, you know, Jesus will make your life better. Jesus will make all your circumstances in this life better. Like, <clears throat> that's, never, that's never the message of the Bible. That's purely Joel Osteen's and Oprah's message. But, but the Bible's message is fear God and worship him alone. Fear God and give glory to him. Fear meaning being in awesome reverence before God. Because the time's coming, it has come, it says, when he will sit as, it, as judge. And so the angel's like, hey, time's up. Here is, in essence, it's your last opportunity, but, but again, it's not perfectly chronological, so we can't say for sure if this is occurring before or after the mark of the beast that we saw in the last message, but here's what we do know, guys. God always sends grace and mercy before his required judgment falls. God always first sends grace and mercy. And then the judgment upon sin that must come from God because he is first holy and just and righteous, then the judgment comes. But the good news is, is that he sends grace and mercy first. Grace is us receiving what we don't deserve. That's, that's the righteousness of Christ in eternal life. Mercy is us not receiving what we do deserve. That is paying for, paying the full penalty for our own sins for eternity. God sends his mercy and grace in Jesus Christ before his required judgment must fall. Right down there next to verses six and seven, Matthew 24, 14, are you guys cold? It kind of it kind of looks like some of you are cold. Okay, all right. Uh, Matthew twenty four verse fourteen, Jesus says, "And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come." Now listen, here's something that, that I struggle with a little bit because this is all of that discourse, and and since I was saved. You know, <laughs> in, a, in a world where there were no cell phones, <laughs> there was color TV when I was saved, but uh, no internet, no cell phones, man. That's like, that's like dinosaur. Yeah, that's what it is, dinosaur. Jeez, uh, I've heard this since I was saved, that the Olivet Discourse is used as a, as like a prelude to the rapture. But if you really, if you really look at it, it's more of a prelude to the end of the tribulation. Uh, but don't let me, don't let me, you know, challenge uh, anybody who uses for that, uses it for the rapture because they're using it to say, get saved now, and and you should. But I, I don't know if this is referring to before the rapture or after. I, I think it's. I mean, I'm sorry, but I think it's after. The good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. That's exactly what Revelation 14, 6, and 7 just said. So, ready to move on? See, that's how many are we are. We're at four now. Next, the next victory. Next victory in Revelation 14 is over false religion. Man, I'm screaming through the text today. Hey, you guys want to get out early today? <laughs> it's raining. Okay, I'll try. Maybe I'll finish before it starts raining. Revelation 14, 8, the next victory we see in chapter 14. Then another angel followed him through the sky, shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. 
because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Again, though uh, certainly a physical side to this as the world uh, continues down that, that, you know, dark trail. Uh, but really the, the primary focus here is spiritual immorality, spiritual adultery. Babylon the Great, listen, we don't even read about Babylon and Babylon the Great and, and being the great prostitute, um, which is a reference. Babylon is used as a reference to a number of things, and we'll talk about it when we get there, but right here, it is a reference to the false prophets, one world religion, the apostate church the great prostitute of Revelation 17 referring to the apostate church, God is guaranteeing the victory before we meet the enemy. So we did meet the false prophet last week, but, but we see the, uh, the, the real like big damage uh, that he and the Antichrist do together when we get into chapter 17. But God is already assuring us the victory over that false one world system of political military with the Antichrist and religion with the false prophet. This is the guarantee that that victory is going to come. Babylon is fallen. It's as if it had already happened, but it hasn't yet. But that's the point of the chapter is it will fall. Every one of these victories will come to pass. Again, the wine of her immorality, uh, referring primarily to spiritual adultery, apostate church, final world religion, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the false prophet's religion will all be judged. And I think it was Wednesday night we reviewed that. Uh, we turned to that and saw that in chapter 20. Um, but they will be judged, and Jesus Christ alone will be worshipped at the beginning of the, of the millennium, which again we'll see when we get to chapter 20. The point is, is that God is listing victory after victory after victory after victory in chapter 14 of Revelation to do one thing. What is it? Remind us that Jesus wins. All right, try not to be so excited about it. <laughs> listen, listen. Okay, when the day comes, <laughs> we're gonna realize the only thing that matters is that we're on his side when he wins. Amen? Amen. All right, Jesus wins in the end. Next, next victory. This is, the next victory is really for those who do not worship the beast. So those in the tribulation who have refused to worship the beast and die accordingly, but leading up to the victory of those who do not worship the beast, the Bible starts, chapter 14 starts with those who do worship the beast. So maybe to show a contrast there. Revela are you with me? Okay, Revelation 14, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, verse 10, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshiped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Whoa. Do you want to know why, in my humble opinion, I am H O? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, I have a little dictionary on my desk. It says like cool text talk, you know, and it teaches me those <laughs> acronyms. No, listen, I don't, I don't. I actually write full words, you know, it's old school. Um, listen, listen, do you know why I think the devil has worked so hard to remove the concept of hell from church? Do you know that? I mean, the last 50 years in our church culture, hell is not an acceptable thing to talk about. Why? People don't like to hear about it. It doesn't make them feel warm and fuzzy. And in the last, at least the last 30 or so years, the seeker-sensitive church movement says, don't tell them anything that might upset them. Make them feel warm and fuzzy so they come back next week. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to stand in front of Jesus with that. Well, this is what I was doing. I'm just trying to grow a big church. Jesus is like, I had 12. Who do you think you are? Uh, listen, here's why, here's why we've taken hell out. Because people don't like to hear about it. Here's why the devil has taken hell out so that we lose the intensity of sharing the gospel. Because if we really understand or if we really accept what the Bible says here, we're gonna tell somebody that we love, listen, you do not want to be here when this happens. If we believe all the good stuff about God in the Bible, eh, we kinda have to believe this stuff too. Right? Wow. This is actually the Bible's description of hell. Uh, and it's hardcore. And these verses 9 through 11 make it clear that those who choose the Antichrist over Jesus Christ will bring God's wrath upon themselves, God's full wrath, and their torment will rise up forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night. That's a picture of hell, and that is what Jesus Christ came to freely offer you victory over. One of the, one of the troubles with the, like the, uh, you know, I just call it the seeker-sensitive gospel, which says, you know, receive Jesus, he'll make everything better in your life. And I'm like, um, all right, so I'm 40, almost 45 years in, uh, when, when's that part start, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, don't be afraid. <laughs> Jesus has made, has made my life wonderful, but the world has still been full of tribulation. Uh, but he's been so, so good to me. But listen, um, you have to know what you're saved from in order to know the value of your salvation. If you don't know what you're saved from, then how can you know the value of your salvation? If you don't know what you're saved from, how can you know the depth of the price that Jesus Christ paid on your behalf so that you don't have to face what you're being saved from? Once we understand that there can be no sin in God's presence and the separation from God's presence means being in Satan's presence. And once we understand that, we're like, yeah, let me, let me rethink that. Uh, I, think, I think God is better. The Bible says the only way to that victory is to receive Jesus Christ by faith as your Savior and make him your Lord. And in that process of you putting your faith in Jesus, he becomes your sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, and pays the full price on your behalf for your sin. And he gives you his righteousness freely so that you can stand as righteous before God. The reason people turn down the gospel is because they don't understand how badly they need it. 
They're like, no, it's all right. I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pretty good. I try to be a good person. I'll let, I think God will let me in. Oh, you've never read the Bible. Oh, no, I read the Bible. No, no, you haven't. There can be no sin in God's presence. Jesus Christ faced your hell on your behalf so that you could live for eternity in his heaven with him. And the only way we get to that point is by receiving him by faith. The Bible is very clear about that. Faith in Christ is the only way. Not, not because, listen, it's not, see, you see what happens when I notice I have a little extra time? I'm like, oh, good, I can rant. Um, listen. I move on. I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't have that much time. In, in contrast to the eternal judgment, let's move on to the good news, okay? That, that's enough. Sometimes, you know, like that's, that was enough about hell, right? Everybody kind of got the picture? Okay, all right. All right, moving on. Uh, verses 12 and 13 in Revelation 14. There's a call to endurance And then there's a promise of victory for all those who have put their faith in Jesus as their savior. So we just, we were leading up to these verses by looking at the last verses. That's the people who reject Christ. Now we have the victory here, people who endure, who persevere in their faith in Christ. Revelation 14, verse 12, this means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. Now listen, this is written specifically or initially for those in the tribulation. God's holy people in the tribulation must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. But that's just as true today as it will be in the tribulation. It will be a little more like aggressive or a little more out front in the tribulation, but it's the same today. We've got to persevere. We've got to hold on to Jesus. Look at verse 13, Revelation 14. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. It's speaking specifically of the tribulation, but it's true for us today. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, from every moment on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. Another super guarantee of victory for those who endure the tribulation, the great tribulation, but also the trials and tribulations of this world and hold on to Jesus in the midst of those difficulties. Speaking specifically of the tribulation, those who persevere in the tribulation, they're gonna die. They're gonna die. They're either gonna die from starvation or or they're gonna be killed Uh, for trying to buy food without the mark. They're gonna die. But the Bible says they will be blessed for eternity because of their faithfulness and their endurance for Jesus. Same with us, maybe without the guillotine part, guillotine part, but it's still the same with us. So, thankfully, although we're not facing the mark of the beast today, the same victory is reserved for us. As we endure the trials and tribulations today, and, and, you know, we believe we'll be caught up and miss, we'll, be missed, we'll miss the entire rapture, but we can still say this applies today. So listen, please. I, no matter what, honestly, you know, um, abounding or abasing, having plenty or suffering need, Paul says in Philippians, I can do this through Christ. I can hold on to Christ. If times are good right now, then do not hold on to the good times because the times they are a changing. <laughs> Whatever they are, if they're bad, they're changing to good. If they're good, they're gonna, you're gonna experience some bad, some tribulation. Whatever you're in right now, hold on to Jesus. Persevere. Hold on to the Lord 
because he's gonna win in the end. And you need to know that your victory is guaranteed by God. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been sealed for victory by God. Hold on to that. All right, so quick review. We've seen victory for the 144,000 on Mount Zion. We've seen victory in the heavenly praise, the worship concert for them in heaven. We've seen, seen victory in the gospel covering the earth. We've seen victory over the false religion of Babylon. And we've seen victory, hold it, how, am I, how did I get to six? I'm, oh no, five, right? What is it? One, two, three, four, okay, five, five. We've seen victory over those who refuse to worship the beast. That's five out of seven. So now at the end, we see two final victories. And um, uh, the first one's easier than the second one. <laughs> uh, but these two victories are in harvest. These are two final harvests of the world. So in Revelation 14, God gives John this vision of the final harvest of the world, both for the saved and the unsaved. And really, when it all gets down to it, which one of these two harvests we are in is, again, all that will matter for eternity. So here are the two harvests spelled out. First harvest is the harvest of believers. It's in verse 14, Revelation 14, 14. Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. That's Jesus. That's Jesus preparing to harvest the believers from the earth. Verse 15 of Revelation 14 says, then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. That's a message from the Father sent to the Son. You know, let's, let's wrap this up. Let's take all the believers off the earth right now. And so the sickle comes, the earth is harvested of all believers. Verse 16, Revelation 14 says, so the one sitting on the cloud, that's Jesus, swung his sickle over the earth and the whole earth was harvested. This is the final victory on the earth. It hasn't occurred yet, remember it's not chronological, it's reminding us that this is what is going to happen. All believers will be harvested from the earth. It's being promised, it's being guaranteed so that we know for sure that Jesus wins in the end of all this, right? All right, now we see the other harvest. That's one for believers. Here is the other one, Revelation 14, verse 17. After that, another angel came from the temple in heaven and he also had a sharp sickle. How do we know it's not Jesus? Because of verse 18. Then another angel who had power to destroy with fire, came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, swing your sickle now to gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. The word here for ripe means overripe. It's past time. It's past time for this judgment. Verse 19 finishes it. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. This is also a victory. It's our seventh victory today. It is the victory, I, I, and I know, I know, this is, I, I, it's the victory over those who have rejected Christ. It's the victory over those who belong to the world. It's the victory in a sense over sin. It's not the ultimate victory over sin, but it is a victory over sin. It's the removal of all those who have rejected God's salvation. And it is in preparation for the millennium. 
So the, again, the millennium's not happening yet. It's just John is seeing it happen. How great's the final victory over the sin and those who belong to the world? It's in verse 20. Um, this, this, is, this is victory, okay? But it's not, this is the one you want to avoid. Revelation 14, verse 20. The grapes were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress in a stream about 180 miles long, as high as a horse's bridle. That is the winepress of God's wrath. The um, imagery here is of the Battle of Armageddon that we'll see in chapter 19. When, when Jesus slays the armies of the world with the sword of his word, of his mouth, and the vultures come down and gorge themselves on the bodies. But it's a reference here to the absolute victory over those who stand against Christ, over those who belong to the world and who ultimately will show up in the valley of Armageddon, the Jezreel Valley, the Valley of Megiddo, um, and there will be a, a battle there between the armies of the world, the great armies of the world, and Jesus Christ. And the blood will run in a stream 180 miles as high as a horse's bridle. Now listen, in Israel, 180 miles is a long way. 180 miles is like there's a section in the south of Israel that's, that's pretty much uninhabited. Uh, Really, once you get past like Hebron in the south, it's, it's just desert. But the distance from the north end of Israel, which you, know, you could call the north end of the, the Jezreel Valley, 180 miles goes all the way past Jerusalem and Hebron and, and into the desert. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not quite the whole country, but... For us, we think, yeah, 180 miles, that's not bad. I drive that, you know, to work every day. Uh, but in Israel, you're driving almost the entire country. 180 miles, a stream of blood as high as a horse's bridle. Write down in your margin there, Joel, or should I say Joel? Write down in your margin there, Joel 3, Joel 3, 1 through 16, the beginning first section of, of Joel 3 is the prophetic commentary on this battle, and it's super intense. So here's the deal. Um, I want you to hear today, because we've been in some tough stuff in Revelation, and, and honestly, there's a bit more coming. It's actually, um, it's actually gonna get worse before it gets better, but but we've been in some rough stuff and God purposely made chapter 14 to stop and say, remember, Jesus wins. And so seven visions of victory, one after another in Revelation 14, so that you and I will always remember that Jesus wins in the end. And listen, we are so caught up in our day-to-day -day circumstances, and we want God so bad to fix our day-to-day -day circumstances that, that when we're in the midst of those trials and tribulations, very seldom do we say, you know what, Lord? You win, right? Like, yeah, this is something, and yeah, I pray that, pray that you'll help me through it. But I'm standing here today saying, I know you win and I win in you. And so if the world gets you discouraged or deceived, and you begin to be drawn away from the cross and into the world, and you, you get to where you're kind of playing both sides, have you ever known a Christian, you know, walking with the Lord real well for a while, and then, you know, remember, remember, Jesus wins. Jesus wins wins. Don't get far from him. Get close to him. Because when it's time, you want to be right there with him, holding tight to him. And so we have to run the race with endurance. 
We have to keep pressing on with perseverance. We have to trust the Lord. We have to follow him. And we have to know that we win in him. And so we've got to abide in him. We've got to remain in him for that victory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this encouraging chapter, Lord, just to give us um, just... Lord, a, a break, mostly a breath from, from the world just absolutely being taken over by hell in the second half of the tribulation. Thank you, Lord, that you take this chapter to remind us you win. You have already won. It is already finished. And so, Lord, we pray as we move through this earth that our eyes would be set on that victory beyond the horizon. And, Lord, whether we have a day or a 100 years, Lord, may we keep our eyes set on you. May we always be ready to experience, Lord, the victory in you that you have guaranteed us. And let me just say as we close, if you've never if you've never, or if you have have but maybe have fallen away. I mean, there's only two sides, and Jesus says no gray area. You're either with me or against me. If there's even a doubt in your mind, just come back. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus, do it now. We'll just wait for you. You just pray and say, Lord, save me. Lord Jesus, I believe. I put my faith in you. Please come into my life. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the strength, the perseverance to keep my eyes set on you until the day I show up in your presence. Thank you for saving me. In your own name I pray, Jesus. Amen.